Hello, I'm Dave Burst, author of How to Get to Great Ideas. Hello. I'm obsessed with innovation and creativity. <laughs> and in this film, I'm going to be looking at how businesses can get better ideas out of their employees. Way back before we'd invented the idea of jobs, humans had two options. You could either live as part of a larger community, morning, or they could try to go it alone. Those in a group had a good chance of passing on their DNA to the next generation. Those who were going it alone had more chance of passing on their protein to a wild beast. The desire to be part of a larger crowd is bred into us. We're pack animals. You may think us humans have changed since we moved off the plains and started living in cities. We're civilised now. We wear deodorant. We drink frappuccinos. We've got a whole bunch of Facebook friends and a handful of nice endorsements on LinkedIn. But underneath it all, we haven't changed very much. Fitting in is still important to us, as the classic grey suit demonstrates. But in the world of business, it's conformity that kills ideas. In my career, I've dealt with dozens of organisations in just about every sector. In recent years, there's been a trend for businesses to do cultural change programmes, but most of them are doing it wrong. They're simply copying some of the extracurricular activities that good companies do without changing the important bit that happens from nine to five. And unsurprisingly, it doesn't get them very far. So I want to explore what great culture actually is. The best way to do that is to give you an example. So we're off to see a company that's doing an amazing job. This is Havas Links. It's a healthcare agency that works with the world's biggest pharmaceutical brands. It employs more than 350 people, and nearly half of those have joined as graduates. How many companies do you know where people stick around in their first job for that long? And Havas Links put it down to investing in their culture. Great culture starts with actually caring about your staff, which goes way beyond the obvious stuff like free fruit, free coffee, and the occasional boozy night out. These things are all lovely to have, but great culture comes from the very top of the company and trickles down through the whole organisation. All of these little benefits are just ways of demonstrating the care. I know. I love you too. But it's not just about doing stuff for the masses. You need to do your caring at a personal level too. Because it's such a flat structure, you can literally talk to anybody. It's really nice that Havas Links lets us bring our dogs to work. So recently my father was diagnosed with bowel cancer. Straight away, compassionate leave was offered and they just said keep in touch. There's a netball club and a football club. It was free fruit throughout the week. So when I came back from maternity leave, it was quite scary and they made everything really, really easy. As you might imagine, a lot of thought goes into these activities. In fact, the company has a name for them. They call them Lynx Life. Lynx Life uh, could be a very wide term and cover an awful lot of things here, but it's a programme designed specifically to reduce frustrations for people at work. It covers all sorts of things, so we've got Ambie and Angela, the tea ladies, making sure that we have tea and coffee. Um, there's sports and wellness activities, there's financial support, there's mental health support, there's sabbatical opportunities, there's all sorts of different things that fall under the Lynx Life programme. Claire has plenty to say about this because, well, the company has lots of benefits. Lots and lots of them. All designed around making sure people can make the best of their time at Lynx. How about this for a commitment to education? Have us Links run a serious training programme for about six months out of the year. Whenever they release their training calendar, many of the sessions book up in minutes. Faster than Glastonbury, apparently. I want to go and see if I can learn something. And buy a copy if, if you've... Just... Uh, Sorry. So excuse. some of you might know that I've written a book. It's called Sorry. How to Get to Great Ideas, which pretty much sums up what the... What the what the book is about, um, but I'd like to tell you a little bit more about it regardless. Um, it, this is but you also need to give people the freedom to use their abilities. If you've got a great bunch of people with great skills, it's a bit of a waste treating them all the same. People are obviously different, and it's that difference that makes them valuable. 
you're managing staff intelligently, you'll encourage them to use their knowledge and skills in a way that works best for them. That involves trusting your staff, which a lot of organisations are too afraid to do. But I'd understand it if you didn't trust that guy. Hey, come on, what did I do? You know. So there's a certain amount of people within the company be able to shape their own roles. Mm -hmm. So rather than being told what to do, they kind of create their own way of doing what needs to be delivered. Mm -hmm. Is that harder to manage? <laughs> I want to be like, no, it's fine. But yeah, of course it is. <laughs> like, it definitely is. Um, I think that we encourage it though, because what you don't want is a job description and then you think, right, I'm sticking to this job description. On certain roles where discipline is now more established, of course there is a baseline between different levels within that discipline. Um, that said, we have 10 different teams here, all the teams have different clients, it's completely different how some of them work. Um, so you do have to have that element of flex as well. Um, but that's what we like as a culture. We want to be adaptive and be flexible with things. Um, so yeah, it maybe takes a different approach to management and a different approach to HR, but but that's cool. It is indeed cool. This approach helps to avoid the negative impact that hierarchies have on thinking. Most companies will agree that ideas are valuable. Their future depends on them after all. But most organisations are also pretty good at damaging them. Oh, clumsy me. That's because they expect the ideas to travel through the layers of their hierarchy on the way up to the decision maker. Oopsie. The journey to the top is paved with naysayers, criticism and seemingly harmless adjustments. Oops. But these tweaks take their toll on the idea and it quickly loses its magic. On top of that, the setbacks take the energy out of the project. Oh, here we go, I'm nearly there. So it's a miracle if any idea ever sees the light of day. It doesn't work like that in this office. Everyone has access to the leadership team, even directly to the CEO. Sorry about that. Oh. The way you manage people has a massive effect on the ideas you get from them. For example, you may imagine that offering people rewards would be a great way of encouraging them to come up with better ideas, but strangely, that could work against you. Studies show that rewards encourage people to do a job faster. That's great if you want to get people to do a repetitive task more efficiently, but coming up with ideas isn't like that. The best ideas come from exploring lots of areas, testing out new options and questioning assumptions. If you want to encourage that, you need to offer recognition instead. Recognition gets you to more than just the minimum amount of thinking. That's why we've got award shows like the Oscars, the Grammys, the Tonys, the Turner Prize and the Booker Prize. Recognition makes people try harder. The advertising industry has its fair share of awards too. And Havas Links is no stranger to going on stage to pick them up. But they don't just believe in external recognition. No way. They go so far as to hold their very own awards programme for the agency, complete with dressing up, gala dinner and trophies. And it's as good as any awards ceremony you'll ever go to. But recognition shouldn't just be reserved for an annual knees up. What stage were you at when you started in the company? So I joined Havas Links just over seven years ago as a graduate. Um, sort of in that time of, you know, progress, been promoted a few times. Uh, I'm now on the leadership team um, and sort of, you know, through all stages of my, I guess, development and all stages of my career was, you know, kind of recognised whether that was by Dave Hunt or my line manager um, or just people who I work with and people who, you know, I interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. But there, there is definitely that culture of recognition. Of course. Recognition isn't the only factor that affects motivation. Another way of uniting and motivating your staff is by having a clear purpose.
This isn't anything particularly new. Companies have been coming up with mission statements for years. Assertively supplying performance-based infrastructures. Efficiently creating economically sound data. Overcharging parents through pester power. I'm familiar with that one. You see, it's not actually about mission statements. It's about having a higher purpose to make the world a better place in some way. And when you've got something like that, your staff will actually want to help you make it happen. So one of the things that Havas Lynx has got as a, as a remit is delivering helpful change, which sounds like a fantastic phrase, but what does it actually mean in real life? We live and die by the quality and effectiveness of our communications. And really all it boils down to is, are we providing things that are relevant, engaging, meaningful, and, and, and have an impact? They change behaviors. Do they improve health outcomes? That's the simple way we, we, we go about assessing their effectiveness. A successful culture and all the positive things that come with it only works because it comes from the top. If business leaders are expecting their staff to act in a certain way, they need to lead by example. So let's go right up to the top of the company and speak to the CEO. Now, you have worked for the agency for a considerably long time. Can you tell me how you started? What was your experience when you started? When I first walked in, we were probably 15, 16 people. Uh, today, we're north of 350. But I think the thing that stayed the same is the culture and the energy and the vibe. Uh, the smiles on people's faces, uh, the community spirit, uh, and the ethos and the DNA of the agency is very much still the same today. What are the difficult parts of that growth journey been? I would say for us, the most important transformation we went through, we call it Pride, and it would be around 2013. We were about 100 people, went for a couple of beers, we'd just been down in London meeting clients, we're chatting about it and we're trying to work out, like, God, you know, isn't it hard at the moment? Where is me? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, God, it used to be great. Remember when we were like, you first joined, Dave, and it was 25 people. Everyone had a smile on their face, and everyone took responsibility, and everyone had pride in them. Wasn't it good, Dave? Wasn't it good? And, um, and it struck us that actually, that's how we should set ourselves up. So once we as a senior team have gone, right, let's do this. We're going to take our 100 people agency, and we're going to break it down into four different teams. And if we get this wrong, and if we're not right, we're screwed. Because where'd you go? You've ripped up the entire fabric of your business. You've tried something new. There's no putting it back together. So if you're gonna do this, you've gotta do it right. So over the course of sort of six to eight weeks, this is running from, I don't know, beginning of July to the end of August. We planned it to the nth degree. And then I believe it was the last Friday in August. Brought everyone into the business. I um, said a few words, said, by the way, we're gonna turn the whole agency upside down. We think it's the right thing to do. Can we have your support and your belief? We then went and did uh, like summer games and we were playing like three-legged races and rounders and all these different things. And everyone was doing it in their new teams. While we were out doing that, and obviously we'd have a few drinks in the evening, um, in the office we got a team who was moving everyone around. So as soon as you walked in on the Monday morning, everything was done for you. The keyboard's in the right place, mouse is in the right place, you've got your like lucky pitch or whatever it may be. Everything was, was completely perfect. And that was really for us, that was like day one. That was the launch of, of Linked Pride. What are your ambitions from here on in? Where do you want to take the company and what do you think it is that will, that's the magic you want to keep? This year we fulfilled our vision. So we set out to be the number one healthcare communications agency in the world. We won the Can Lions Healthcare Agency of the Year, so that box is ticked. I'm now working with my team, trying to co-create across the business. What is the vision for the next five years? And it's about being more progressive, it's about being more contemporary, it's about how we can really change healthcare communications. I'm that excited to reveal that and develop it and publish it to the business. But the thing that will be the same is it will be great people doing great ideas, producing great outcomes. And our ambition is to continue to do that. And while we continue to do that, we'll continue to be successful. As I said at the beginning, what I'm most interested in is ideas and what organizations can do to encourage more fruitful thinking, which doesn't happen by doing nothing. You can't expect to suddenly be able to come up with innovative ideas without putting in the work. But all of that hard work is definitely worth it. How do you keep these people fresh and how do you get the great ideas continually coming out of them? 
First of all, you keep them away from the business people. <laughs> <laughs> and seriously, it's like the last thing a creative person needs to know is the, uh, the financial burden that's on their shoulders. It's like just allow them to just be in a happy space. You know, take away all those distractions. Tell them to go to you know somewhere like this. Go get out of work. Be creative somewhere else. How do we get the fresh ideas out of them? Is trust right? First and foremost, trust in the team. Trust. But from a junior point of view, I think they need space to fail. Creativity is quite a fragile thing. It's, it's easy to, to damage creativity. So, so what is the stuff that kills ideas? What's the stuff that people in offices need to avoid? Fear is the biggest one for me. Fear of failure kills creativity. I, I learned earlier on when you pressure yourself, you're not in the environment, men, like mental environment to come up with good ideas. So it's you know, making sure you have faith in your ability and faith in the people around you. Also try to please everybody. Um, sometimes creatives and account people can be like eager puppies. It's like, yes, yes, we'll do this, we'll do it tomorrow, we'll have it ready for you. It's like, no, sometimes you have to go, no, <laughs> let's, just, let's just chill our jets a little bit and let's think about doing this properly because it's going to take a bit of time. The idea of creativity is usually locked within one department, one group of people, people who have got the word creative in their job title. But is, is that the way forward? Should creativity be siloed like that? No, I, I, I really stand against that. And like, if you speak to any member of the team, and probably in Thomas' team, they'd say the same. It comes from insight and knowledge. And the more people you surround yourself with that know it, the better, the better your output will be. So that's them being creative with us. Okay, I think we need to talk a bit more about creativity. I'm off to meet some of the people whose job it is to come up with ideas in their natural habitat, a pub. Hadass Lynx has got its very own awards show. Is that actually something that's worth winning if it's only an internal kind of award? There's a really good motivation for the people that work at Lynx, uh, not just creative folk, uh, all the accounts people, planners, medical guys get involved, and it's a brilliant showcase. So from looking at the, the internal awards then, which, which one of you is the best? Healthy competition. It is, yeah, yeah, it, it, and that's part of it as well. You know, the competition side of it is good when it's healthy, um, and it hasn't yet spilled over into you know people punching each other. There, there's one of these words that's bandied around a lot in business these days is productivity. Mm. How much of what you're doing would you say is what you would then call sort of being productive, and how much is being unproductive? So when you talk about productivity, we don't sit there and work for 7.25 hours a day. We'll, we'll sit and we'll talk to people and we'll come for a drink or we'll, we'll go and chat to someone else. And all them little cogs are turning all the time we're doing that. And all of a sudden something will just click. Thank you all so very much. Cheers. It'd be completely understandable if you're still a bit sceptical about this creative stuff. Maybe you see creativity as something fluffy that costs money rather than earns money. But it's creative thinking that leads to ideas and ideas are what differentiates companies and gives them an advantage. So if we want to see if the company's investment in culture is worth it, it's probably best to talk to the finance director. So what are the, the actual financial benefits to the company? You know, to do that, you'd have to look at our growth. You know, for the last sort of eight years, we've grown 20% almost year on year on year. I guess that for me is the ultimate financial benefit of, of, of the investment we make. Things like staff retention, staff referrals, people's longevity with the company. That for me are all the metrics that we'd use to sort of go, that was a great investment, we should continue to do that. So if you hadn't done this stuff, do you think the company would be as successful and as profitable as it is now? Absolutely not. Like, no way, no way. I think the, the investment we've made, we're all very pleased with that. And we know that that is one of the key ingredients to it. Yeah, the culture is the intangible part that drives the business forward. But I know that the investments we make in terms of the activities and the investment we put in certain staff events definitely are forming a huge part of our, uh, of our success. With innovation and creative thinking becoming increasingly important business skills, I've been fascinated with what it is that makes some companies better at coming up with ideas than others. And Havas Links are definitely a good example. Companies that actually care for their staff like they do are sadly too rare. They do everything they can to make their employees' lives better. They invest in their skills, they have a vision their staff can get behind, and it all pays off for the business. One of the best ideas for any company is to learn from what they're doing and maybe pick up a book that talks about this stuff. But for now, a good idea would be to roll the credits. Thank you for watching. Yeah, but where are you going to, mate?
I've got no idea.